Guide us through the kind of uh, conversations in the genesis of this adoption plan and how long. So basically when we design, when the government started discussing the new vision 2050 and the five year strategic plan, uh, we also discussed where will the growth in decent jobs come from. Right. And what is clear is the growth in services is very important, but it does not necessarily bring the type of jobs that you want for the youth. So the discussion started from that point of view, is where do we get these decent jobs? Right. The second point of view was, well, as you know, Rwanda is positively obsessed with ICT. Right. But the question is now, how do we leverage the infrastructure that we've had to have an industrial revolution based on ICT, right. where we actually produce IT products? So the combination of the two started the conversation around what should be the role of NIADA oh. as a government agency to facilitate the private sector to play an active role, the role that we wanted to play in these two very concrete objectives. And there goes that buzzword again, uh, near uh, fourth industrial revolution, as you yes. mentioned in your article as well. And now uh, let's touch on what's happening. So you have this open call and um, you're basically saying that uh, uh, anyone can apply if they have a specific criteria, but it's not for startups or emerging companies. Uh, help us understand why. So we have different products that we're developing for different needs of enterprises. Mm. This particular campaign or this particular open call is not for startups, right. but it doesn't mean that we don't care about startups. Right. When, we'll have, when we launch the official product around fourth industrial revolution, you can imagine that we'll focus mainly on startups. Right. So the reason why this particular call is more for the existing industries is we're trying to gauge what is the impact of a technology boost into the productivity of a company. Right. So if you inject modern technology to a traditional industry, what happens? How much productivity boost can you gain? Right. Or how much productivity gain can you have at the company? And how many jobs can be created from this productivity boost? Right. So because we're testing the model to see how will the companies react, how will we adjust our own support, we wanted to deal with companies that do not have the typical teething problem of startups. Right. But I would like to promise you that the next launch is for startups. Right, I'm sure you have something for startups. I was, we were just discussing this on the side, but uh, let's talk about uh, now the, uh, the sectors that you settled on, garment and banana wine. Um, we know what hap what's happening from now moving forward, but settling on this too because they have the potential to take up technology within the sectors is something that we've still not wrapped our minds around. So the reason why we chose these two sectors is because one, they don't have market issues. Mm. If you know Rwanda, you'll know that banana wine doesn't have a market issue. If right. anything, the local production is not sufficient for the market. Mm. And every single village in Rwanda actually has a banana wine processing plant. So right. it's a low hanging fruit in terms of rural penetration of technology. And because we've, we've tried as a government to push for better standards and better standardized product, it's, there's a natural demand for technology in that field. Right. The same for garment. You're very familiar with the ban on secondhand clothes. Right. And we want Rwandans to wear dignified Perfect clothes. Timing. Where are they going to come from? Right. So we need to instill technology to allow our small tailors to start doing industrial type production. Right, so now which brings us now to the point, okay, so we have the injection of technology and ideally we'd think that you would take over a company or fund a company within a certain element, but this is not it. You're going a full 360 with any of the companies that you decide to support. But if they're huge companies, they already have the reserve and the financial resource to do that on their own. So what we've figured out is that by talking to the company actually, some larger companies say, I don't need technical equipment, what I need is advice. I need to know right. how do I improve my floor plan, how can I improve my packaging, how can mm. I improve my branding, how can I have a better standardized product. So that's for the larger companies. Right. Now the smaller companies tend to ask for business advisory services. Right. So do I have my cash flow rights? Do I have my supply chain rights? They ask for a bit of equipment to try to modernize their production. Right. And they also ask for support to connect them to financial, uh, financial services, right. so typically banks, BDF, and so on. So the needs of the smaller company and the larger company are different. And what we offer is basically tell us what you need. We don't come with a ready-made formula where mm. we say, well, we give you machines whether you like it or not. We say, come bid, because it's on a bidding basis. Give us your most innovative idea. What we reward is innovation. Right. And then tell us what you need to grow your company. And then in exchange, we'll try to address your needs. But well, in regards to patenting, because I'd imagine if we come in with most of the applications, that's basically it, where you have people submit, submit. They don't make it to the cut, but they find the idea implemented otherwise. So how are you working on the trademarking or patenting bits to ensure that nothing is replicated without the, uh, the owner's consent? So part of NIADA's mandate is actually to help industrialists register their patent. Right. So it's actually part of our core mandate. So in our team, we have intellectual property rights specialists that right. will help you if you have an innovative formula, let's say for your banana wine, right. to help you register it with RDB. So it's part of 
the package of services that we offer to these companies. All right. Uh, Indrika, okay, so we have huge companies that maybe one of the issues has been scale and scale to the region, right, aside from national scale as well. But we've had, within your mandate, you also have issues that touch on across the border, for example, double taxation or uh, issues on standard, uh, standardization certification across the border. So ideally, setting up in Rwanda would mean that you would have to be open enough for anyone who'd want to get out of the country? By now you should know that we're open enough, George. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you are the center of openness. Exactly. You're open in terms of business, right. regional trading. And as you know, every time we, we try to encourage the private sector, mm -hmm. we sell Rwanda as a regional destination. We never sell Rwanda as a national destination. Right. So the entire ecosystem that is around from the government point of view is made for it to be a regional market. Right. So I think this is, this is the starting point for us, is everything that we do, we think about, yes, the Rwandan market, obviously, mm -hmm. but more importantly, the regional market. Right. Let's talk about now tracking, uh, calculating the checkpoints. It's both physical, involved input from producer services and delivered to final consumers. So there's a, a huge uh, a chain. We'd imagine a phase-by-phase -phase tracking of the program. Uh, what does that entail? So basically the program, if a company registers with us for this program, mm. it's a medium-term program. So it's right. three to four years. Okay. It's not a one-year bullet, right? Because it's hand-holding. And if you want to see a productivity boost, you need to follow these companies for at least three to four years. Right. Um, what we do is that we offer a range of services. It doesn't mean that you have to wait four years to get the last service. Mm. You can get the entire package in year one. Mm. But we stay with you for four years to make sure that you don't drop the ball in the meantime. Right. The second thing is we sign a legal contract. This is not free stuff. Huh? Right. There's no free lunch. Right. So by the time we come and help and support you, you sign a contract where you actually have productivity targets. So your support is tied to your own performance over the duration of the project. Right. So for some uh, companies, it may be three years, like the larger companies you were right. talking about. For smaller companies, it may be five years. There's no strict number of years. We are a government agency, we're here to stay. <laughs> right. What we look at is how much time will it need for your business to have that productive productivity boost. Right, so we're imagining, uh, for example, after this, you intend to scale to others, and we have the startups, you'll tell us about the startups as well, but um, one of the issues that was mentioned, and I remember this was within the Volkswagen conversations, was that there's not enough data in Rwanda. So we need to hear from you to calm us down that even as you branch and diversify into other sectors, you have at least a collection of data is going to be as seamless as possible, and the process of dissemination can be as uh, transparent as possible. Just guide us to that. So we, we're not going into this blind Mm -hmm. What we do is we're not actually helping company by company. We're helping value chains. So we get data for a particular value chain. So right. For example, government, we did a technology audit that looked at the entire value chain. Right. Who has what type of equipment or technology where? Mm -hmm. And where are the gaps? By the time we provide the support, we already have a sense of what is the baseline for this value chain. And then through our annual competitiveness report, we'll be able to track whether the value chain is actually progressing. So there is monitoring at the enterprise level, right. but for the, for the benefit of policy making, there's also monitoring at the value chain level. Mm -hmm. So that we are able as an agency to advise government and say, uh, policy makers, ministries, cabinet, and say, look, we've invested in this value chain, but maybe Rwanda is not very competitive right. despite our efforts. So let's pick another winning horse. Or this one, we thought would be medium potential, and it's actually very high potential. We need to push in investment. Right. So the entire pro program is actually based on data gathering at the micro level, which is an enterprise, but also at the macro level to see what is the impact on industry. Right. Now, eventually what we're tracking is increase in domestic production, increase in exports, and jobs created. Right. Yes. Well, ideally, when we're trying to work out this issue on industrialization, you're on the inside, of course, and you identify the loopholes years after uh, the rest of the general public. What are the, some of the things that we overlook or don't seem to put as much attention that we need to highlight? I think farm capability is something that is very crucial, mm -hmm. and we've seen it in the, all the latest international studies, and I think as countries we need to domesticate that. Giving technical equipment or money to companies is not what makes them grow. Right. What makes them grow is growing their managerial capability, right. giving them capacity to change when there are downturns, for them to know having agility, adaptability. These are some of the skills that we need to teach our companies right. to make sure that you know, when there's an economic, an economic slowdown, they're able to adjust. Mm. When there's an economic upturn, they're able to adjust as well. So we need to stop looking just at equipment and cash and start thinking about building managerial and technical capability of our companies. But who, 